Good afternoon, respected faculties and my dear colleagues. First of all, let me thank Dr. Anupama Madam and Team Pran for giving me an opportunity to do this presentation. So, after a good lunch, it's really a boring topic, discussing on prioritis in pregnancy and how to reach a diagnosis. Let's just have an outlook about what prioritis in pregnancy is and what are the different predisposing causes. I'm not going in detail to each and every cause of pruritus, but I'll be giving importance to the four most important causes that can produce pruritus in pregnancy. So we all know pruritus is a very burdensome symptom and so we can classify pruritus mainly into pruritus with rash and pruritus without rash. So pruritus with rash is mainly the dermatological condition. Three of them are very, very important. One is atopic eruption of pregnancy. Second is pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy, also called the pup. And the third is pemphigoid gestationalis. And there can be other skin conditions like uh, the scabies or urticaria and other insect bite reactions. And with respect to pruritus without rash, we are more concerned about the intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. So this, this is one of the major dermatological complaints in pregnancy. And chronic pruritus is an unpleasant sensation resulting in a need to scratch which lasts more than six weeks. Pruritus is very common in around 18 to 40% of women. We can see majority of the pregnant women, 40% may come to our OP coming and complaining of pruritus and itching. But each and everything may not be pathological. So what are the physiological changes that happen in pregnancy? Is it physiological? Can itching be physiological? Yes, because of the hormonal changes in pregnancy, there can be selective hyperpigmentation and the sweat glands and the sebaceous glands activity increases and the apocrine gland activity decreases. This is one reason for having an itching which is physiological. Another reason is the development of striae gravidarum because of the stretching of the tissue. And this can also stimulate itching. So these are the physiological causes. What about the pathological causes? Coming to atopic eruption of pregnancy, so this is the most commonest dermatological cause which was under a blanket cover of an eczema or prurigo of pregnancy or pruritic folliculitis. All these things now come under the common term atopic erection. So from the term itself, it's linked something with a atopic dermatitis. So the patient may be having a history of an atopy or there may be a family history of atopy. And this usually presents from the early first trimester. That's the difference from the others. Usually starts from early first trimester. And it's basically an T helper T2 mediated disease. Because in pregnancy, there's a shift from TH1 to TH2. So that is why it gets activated again in pregnancy. So you see a lot of eczematous and pruritic lesions, which are mainly papules, which start in the abdomen. And it can extend to the distal extremities. See, you can see these pruritic papules are seen in the distal extremities and also in the lateral aspect of the abdomen. So that is one difference from the pup which we will be seeing now. How do you diagnose? Basically atopic dermatitis from the history and also from the dermatological evaluation. None of the tests come positive, immunofluorescence and uh, skin biopsy not indicated here. You can only see if at all you test, you can see the IgE levels are elevated because of the allergy. So basically the treatment includes topical emollients which are the first line. Mainly the skin moisturizers, aqueous creams and menthols can be given for local application. For mild to moderate cases, you can give low potency or moderate potency steroids and systemic antihistamines like chlorpheniramine or the non-sedative ones like the loratadine and citrusine. Moderate to severe, there is treatment with narrow band UVB phototherapy. This is completely safe in pregnancy. And if nothing works, recalcitrant pruritus, the last option is oral steroids or immunosuppressants like cyclosporin and acetyoprine. Now, about its effects in pregnancy, excellent prognosis. There is no adverse fetal outcome. Just the child may have sometimes an increased chance of atopic eczema later but this will recur in subsequent pregnancy. Coming to the second most, co second commonest situation, that's the pup, otherwise called the polymorphic eruption of pregnancy. 
it's slightly more common, 1 in 100 to 1 in 300. And it happens usually in the third trimester of pregnancy compared to atopic eruption, which happens, starts from the early pregnancy. This happens in the third trimester and may be seen in the immediate postpartum as well. The risk factors associated are mainly primary gravida. So usually seen in primary gravida. So this is not found to recur in the subsequent pregnancies. Usually seen in primary gravida. Also when there is an excessive weight gain and also in multiple pregnancy when there is an overstretching of the skin. So the stretching of the skin will cause the dermal nerve endings to be stimulated and also the damaged collagen fibers will produce an allergic type response. So you see mainly highly pruritic articarial lesions mainly on the abdomen. This doesn't extend to the extremities and you can typically see there is a periumbilical sparing. Periumbilical sparing. And you can see small vesicles may be there 1 to 2 millimeters but no large vesicles or bullae. There are no bullae or blisters here. And involvement of the distal extremity is extremely rare. Management, usually they resolve spontaneously in four to six weeks and treatment is just symptomatic with emollients and antihistamines and topical steroids. Prognosis, it's a self-limiting disorder. It doesn't affect the prognosis of the mom or the baby and recurrence is also rare because it usually happens in the first pregnancy. The third common skin disorder, which is the pemphigoid gestation, is also called as herpes gestation. It's seen in 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 60,000, slightly rare still. And it's a bullous autoimmune disease. It can happen at any time in pregnancy or postpartum. Rarely it can occur associated with the trophoblastic tumors. Most important thing is that it can have certain effects on the baby, like it can produce fetal growth restriction and it can produce preterm labor as well. And in 30 to 50 percent, this will relapse in the subsequent pregnancy and in that case, it can happen earlier and it will be more severe as well. So basically, the reason is the antiplacental antibodies are directed against the basement membrane of the skin. So these will disrupt the basement membrane of the skin and what happens is the blisters. So you can see there are erythematous papules and plaques and you can see bullae and the blisters developing and there is no periumbilical sparing. All around the abdomen it is involving and it can even involve the skin and the mucous membrane. So the gold standard in diagnosis is DIF immunofluorescence and ELISA to look for the antibodies. Uh, the effect on the baby, we said, it can cause preterm labor and fetal growth restriction. And treatment is with highly potent steroids which are non-fluorinated. The fluorinated steroids like betamethasone, dexamethasone, they can cross through the basement membrane. So you give non-fluorinated glucocorticoids like the hydrocortisone and the mometasone. This will not go through the damaged basement membrane. So you can give highly potent glucocorticoids and antihistamines. Nothing works calcineurin inhibitors and steroids and the fetal prognosis is good. So that's about the skin condition. Coming to our obstetric condition that's the intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. So this is based on the recent RCOG guideline released in June 2022. So even though the incidence is less in the western population it's around 1.2 to 1.5 percent slightly higher in the Asian population Indians and the Pakistan Multifactorial, the reason is it could be because of genetic factors, familial factors. Some say it's because of the mutation to certain genes like the ABCB4 which can inhibit the bile acid secretion. So what happens is that the bile acid secretion is not, excretion is affected, bile acids get sequestrated and it can cause itching. Usually the onset is in third trimester, usually after 30 weeks by the late second trimester and third trimester. So gestation, so this is a classification that is gestational pruritus. So what is the definition of intrahepatic cholestasis? It's the pruritus in the absence of a skin condition with abnormal maternal bile acid concentration more than 19 micromoles per liter. So that is the definition. You need a bile acid to diagnose intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Not that your elevated SGOT or SGPT is the criteria to diagnose cholestasis. The abnormal bile acids more than 19 micromoles per liter and this should resolve back after delivery within four weeks of delivery. 
and in pregnancy up to 18 micromoles per liter is normal for the bile acid, more than 19 is considered abnormal. So what is gestational pruritus? Itching with the bile acids within the normal level is gestational pruritus. Mild ICP is bile acid between 19 to 39, moderate is between 40 to 99 and severe is more than or equal to 100. So in any new onset pruritus, if it is associated with a rash, it is unlikely to be intrahepatic cholestasis. But if there is a coexisting eczema, there could be a rash as well. So what are the maternal and perinatal effects in ICP? So mother can have generalized itch. As you know, the itch is mainly on the palms and the soles and the itch gets worsened at night and there is no rash. She, the, her sleep may be affected and sometimes there can be fatty acid malabsorption and vitamin K malabsorption. Jaundice is very minimal and there is an increased risk of developing preeclampsia in 12% and diabetes in 13%. Also, Towards the later stage, there is a small increased risk of immune-mediated diseases like diabetes, thyroid disease, psoriasis and Crohn's disease. And in moderate to severe ICP, that is more than 40, there is higher chance of spontaneous and iatrogenic preterm death and more meconium staining during labor and birth and more chance that the baby may require a neonatal care. What is the risk of stillbirth? Are we worried about the risk of stillbirth? So women with isolated ICP and singleton pregnancy, the risk of stillbirth increases once the bilirubin is more than 100. So if the bilirubin is between 19 to 39, the risk that is in mild ICP, the risk is similar to the normal background risk. Between 40 to 99, where it is moderate, the risk of stillbirth is similar to the background risk till 38 weeks. And... Uh, in presence of risk factors or comorbidities, preeclampsia, GDM and multiple pregnancy, situation is different. There the risk factors. Because of that, there is a slight increase in the stillbirth risk. So this is just a statistics. In mild ICP, the study shows the risk of stillbirth was 0.13. Moderate, it was 0.2. And 3.44% in severe ICP. So how to proceed? So a detailed structured history and examination and information gathering is very, very important in this patient to rule out other causes of itching. So a repeat liver function test and bile acid should be measured if the results come back normal and the woman is having persistent itch. So you have done the test, the results are coming back normal, Person, patient is having persistent itching, very important, you need to repeat it because even a gestational pruritus can progress to an ICP within 4 to 15 weeks. Those who have been diagnosed with an ICP, you need to repeat the result after one week. And then you have to individually depend upon how frequently you need to repeat it. And if there is resolution of itching, if after one week you see that the results have come back to normal and the itching has subsided, it means that the diagnosis is not ICP. It will not come back to normal once the bile acid has elevated, it is ICP. It will not come back to normal during pregnancy. Do you need any other investigations? Previously, the guidelines said you need to have few investigations, including the whole ANA panel, the uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, all these things need to be side blindly investigated. But now the new guidelines say it's not required to routinely screen for other investigations. And invest other investigations like the ANA and asthma and other antibodies need to be done only if the transaminases are markedly elevated or if the ICP begins in the first trimester or early second trimester, there is a rapidly progressing biochemical features or features of liver failure or evidence of any acute infection. And also coagulation testing, PTINR, APTT is not recommended if it's an uncomplicated ICP. So it needs to be managed in a consultant-led unit and severe cases very early presentations and atypical presentations should be managed in conjunction with a hepatologist. And repeat the bile acids after one week. So once this is diagnosed, if it is a mild ICP, weekly bile acids can be tested till they approach 38 weeks. And if it is moderate, because the management is different, 
So weekly bile acid measurements are very very important. Once it is more than 100, there is no point in doing a weekly bile acid because already the damage has already started and happened and the risk of stillbirth is already established. So how do you monitor the fetus? There is a risk of stillbirth. How do you monitor the fetus? It's neither easy to predict or prevent stillbirth in ICP. So you, cannot, you can neither predict nor prevent a stillbirth. So your, the ultrasound or CTG is not useful in predicting or preventing the stillbirth in an ICP. Because it's not associated with fetal growth restriction, you won't see any differences in the Dopplers as well. So what you can do is advise the woman to keep a fetal movement count. And if she finds any difference in the fetal movement count, immediately she has to report. Any role for drugs in the treatment of ICP? Of course, topical emollients can be used for symptomatic relief from itching and antihistamines like chlorpheniramine can be given at night. Only thing is that it gives a sedation, patient will sleep off and she will not be aware of the itching. But uh, per se on ICP, it doesn't have any effect. And the newer guidelines recommend do not routinely offer ursodeoxycholic acid for the purpose of reducing adverse perinatal outcomes in women with ICP. Because it doesn't reduce the perinatal outcome or it doesn't reduce the chance of stillbirth, it's not recommended to routinely offer UDCA. And evidence from RCT show that there is no reduction in adverse perinatal outcome with UDCA. That's why the new guidelines recommend there is no recommendation to offer UDCA. Early onset severe disease in association with the hepatologist, rifampicin being a choleritic can be considered, but only after advice from the specialist. And if the patient has any vitamin K malabsorption or steatoria, then oral vitamin K can be given, which is manadiol phosphate. It's only oral vitamin K, not the injection vitamin K. Oral vitamin K, 10 milligram daily. So when will you deliver a patient with ICP? So mild ICP, because the background risk is same, the pregnancy can be terminated by 40 weeks. In case of moderate ICP, planned birth should be considered by 38 to 39 weeks. And in case of severe ICP, the newer recommendation is to plan birth at 35 to 36 weeks after giving steroids. And also to advise the women that those with comorbidities like diabetes, preeclampsia and multiple pregnancy, the, this has to be individualized based upon the, the condition. So what intrapartum care do you offer? The recommendations are for continuous electronic fetal monitoring only for severe cases of ICP. Mild and moderate can be monitored with intermittent auscultation. And uh, uncomplicated patients, even standard analgesia and anesthesia, including epidurals, can be given. And there is no evidence of increased PPH in uncomplicated ICP. What postpartum care do you offer? So usually the LFTs come back to normal only by the day 10 after delivery because the uh, transaminases are also produced by the breast, the RBCs and also the smooth muscles. So repeat testing of LFT in uncomplicated ICP needs to be done only by day 10 and by 4 weeks postpartum. Very important to, to repeat the LFT and the bile acids. Also ask the patient whether the symptoms of itching are persisting. So if the itching is not persisting and the symptoms of and the LFT and bile acids have come down to normal. Your con diagnosis is also confirmed and it's an intrahepatic cholestasis. So it's persisting beyond six weeks, very important. They should have a hepatologist evaluation. What contraception to offer? So according to UKMEC category one, the copper IUCDs, the Merina and the progesterone devices can be safely given. And combined hormonal contraception can be used provided they do not have a history of contraception-related cholestasis. Whereas, while you give a combined hormonal contraception, if the patient is developing symptoms, it should be taken as contraceptive-related cholestasis and switch on to progesterone methods. So future pregnancies, what should be done? They should be counseled that there is an increased risk of recurrence, around 45 to 90 percent chance of recurrence. So the next pregnancy, they should have a baseline liver function test and bile acid concentration check that the booking visit itself. This is just an overview of what we talked today regarding pruritus in pregnancy without rash and with rash. So with rash, we go to the dermatological conditions. Without rash, it is mainly the ICP. The three dermatological conditions, atopic eruption, pup and the pemphigoid gestationalis. 
Now, rare causes of pruritus without rash are chronic renal failures, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, malabsorption, helminthus. These are all very, very rare causes. But these are the four things that we need to remember when we see a patient with pruritus. Thank you, Dr. Vrinda Menon. We request you to stay. Please have a seat on the desk. And we also invite Dr. Avni Pillai, Associate Professor, Unit Head, Department of Reproductive Medicine, Amrita Fertility Center, to join the desk for the further questionnaire and discussion. Any questions from the audience? Both of them have made uh, very excellent presentations in this short span of 15 minutes. Just one question to you, I mean, in sequential uh, ovulation induction, PCOs, after letrozole you use HMG or? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so after letrozol, five days of letrozol, uh, we usually use HMG once the letrozol is over. So from day two to day six letrozol, followed by seven, eight, nine of HMG, HMG not and FSH. Uh, yeah, because of the cost factor mainly. Cost factor. Can I think most trust to be given to weight reduction? That's very important mm -hmm. because that comes. They have to be counselled regarding uh, weight loss. Most True. important thing before you start any ovulation induction. And regarding OC pills which you give, uh, uh, I think it should be limited to max 14 days, not more than yes, that. Yes, not more than because that. I now, thought actually even in the uh, last ashray which I attended, they were very strongly saying that uh, OCP shouldn't be used at all before uh, to adjust the cycles. So usually what I do is, is either use a uh, progesterone only, like Primilute to regulate the cycles, or even estrogens can be used pre-treatment. but prefer better to avoid OCPs? Uh, see, when you talk about ovulation induction and PCOD patients, especially those uh, anovulatory ones where you see some response, uh, what is the number of cycles do you think you can give them? Obviously, even though technically we say in a regular patient is three to six, four to six cycles, but um, in an anovulatory patient otherwise who's responding, probably that six cycles are the only cycles they get ever get an ovulation. Yes, yes. But because I did, um, I did go through an article where they did t talk about 10 to 12 cycles of ovulation induction in this particular group of patients. Any take on it? No, I would say that um, it depends on a lot of factors. So it depends on the age of the patient also or how anxious she is to go further. But yes, minimum, as you said, six cycles is required because that is the only cycle she's ovulated so far. Uh, depends, you have to counsel the patient, depends on how she is, um, you know, willing. If the cement parameters are normal, you go on to the tubal patency test after, at the end of uh, three to six cycle, three cycles if she's not conceiving. You make sure all the other parameters are normal and then if everything is okay, then you can further try more if the patient is willing uh, for a few more cycles. So I think there would not be any cutoff per se, but uh, uh, six cycles would be minimum. Uh -huh. And uh, when you actually do these ovulation reduction, especially in PCO patients, do you insist on monitoring also for all these patients? Uh, monitoring of ovulation? Yeah, in case... A follicular study. Uh, uh, yeah, you? yeah. So usually uh, we give letrozole followed by HMG, so monitoring is compulsory. Uh, but in patients who have difficult to uh, accessibility or uh, there are patients who, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to come every, you know, the working, it's difficult to come every time. So if I'm sure that the patient is ovulating with letrozole only, uh, I have confirmed in the cycle, I can give letrozole without monitoring also. So letrozole is safe uh, compared to uh, clomiphene letrozole without monitoring for a couple of cycles if I'm sure that one cycle she has ovulated. Because I specifically ask this question because a lot of people do have a tendency to actually, especially in PCOD patients, they'll give letrozole or CC. Without and monitoring. say that from 16th day onwards, they start progesterone. So yeah, that is, should the whole, not be done. The whole work is lost, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Another th the thing is, they tend to take it at home, all the cycles. They'll take say, 12, 15 cycles, they'll keep up because uh, once you have said you can do it at home, they'll start doing it. So yeah, home, what so uh, Dr. Parshu says is that once we give letrosol, even if we are giving unmonitored, say we say, okay, fine, you have ovulated for a particular cycle, 
Next cycle, uh, you take letrozole without monitoring, but then do not start progesterone from a particular date because we are not sure when she's going to ovulate. She might ovulate on day 15, 17, 18, so it may be a late ovulation, and if you are starting progesterone early, it may actually inhibit ovulation. So that shouldn't be done, definitely. There's one question to Varanta. As, as so deoxycholic acid, you said, doesn't re uh, reduce a perinatal outcome. But uh, for the liver function as such, is there any indication for giving it? Do you not give it at all, or uh, according no, the to the new guidelines? The recent recommendations say it doesn't much alter the liver function, because liver function will not that much get elevated in an ICP as such. It's mainly the bile acid that is important. So it doesn't have any effect on the bile acid. So liver function only mildly gets elevated and reducing it by one or two or by tens doesn't make any difference in the management. So it's out now. Yes.